So that, that seems like a natural a transition to talk a little bit about your own uh, itinerary for many years working on global health issues uh, and now uh, global poverty issues. Talk a little bit about the connections you've seen yourself and your own experience and, and, and in the field. Well, you know, <clears throat> this idea of building a science of delivery, it comes from my 25 years of working in the field. Here was the spark of it. So um, I had spent 25 years... And, and for the first um, uh, 19 of those years, uh, there was no money for global health. We were begging for pennies. There was, uh, there was just no money out there. And, and to a great extent, thanks to Jeff Sachs, what he told us was you've got to stop using the M number and start using the B, uh, the, the B <laughs> word, not the M word, the b- not billions, but billions. Yeah. And my, my goodness, in around 2003, all of a sudden we went from nowhere to having you know the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which was really the biggest change, and then the global fund, and so all of a sudden we were looking at 10 billion a year for global health. When in the past it was a couple hundred million, and so we had to change our thinking. And in, in, in a real sense, the dog had caught the car, and now we're thinking, <laughs> now they caught the car. What do we do with it? Yeah. And so I was at the World Health Organization at the time, watching all this happen, and I began to 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 say to our team, Oh my goodness, now that we have the money. We've really got to deliver. Yeah. And, and then what I noticed was that um, uh, uh, our approach to actually delivering on, uh, in global health was scattered. Everyone was creating their own project. Everyone was creating their own electronic medical record. Nobody was talking to each other. And so I came back from the World Health Organization uh, to Harvard and began asking my friends, uh, Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, my friends in the, in the systems engineering department at MIT, the fundamental question was, why is it that when it comes to our most cherished social goals, health, education, social protection, that not only do we tolerate poor execution, sometimes we celebrate poor execution. Yeah. In fact, poor execution is a symbol of how much we care about the mm. poor. It's about the spirit of charity and giving. It's not about execution. And, you know, I was just on a panel today with Paul Volcker, who said that a very uh, wise man once said that vision without execution is hallucination. (laughs) And, 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 you know, so much, so much of aid has been about the aid giver. Right. right? Right. And so it was, the, the focus was, look at me, look how generous I am, look how, you know, I'm, uh, 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 magnanimous I am. It's about the act of giving. And what we're trying, what we tried to do, this was, this was Paul Farmer and myself and Michael Porter, you know, in the mid-2000s, we tried to think about a way of talking about actual delivery. What would it take to take the lessons from development over the many years and actually improve delivery itself? And so we began writing case studies and, and talking uh, about how to build this. When I was at Dartmouth uh, uh, for three years, we built something called the Center for Healthcare Delivery Science, trying to bring that kind of spirit. Because you know, if you if you think that we've brought a science of delivery to American healthcare or American education, we haven't. Right. You know, great institutions like Wesleyan have been there for so many years and you know stand for themselves. But when you look at the community colleges, when you look at our public school system, there's so much uh, uh, that we could do better. Yeah. Yep. And one question is, for example, are the American uh, school systems doing what Shanghai did. You know, if you look at the program from international student assessment, the PISA scores that come out of OECD, right. Shanghai has been number one for a long time. Now, you know, there's a question about whether all the students are in school sure. in Shanghai, but the one thing they do is they, they're saying, they're sending their teachers all over the world and saying, if anyone is doing something well, we want to find out what that is and we want to bring it to Shanghai. Have we had that kind of commitment in the social sector? I can tell you that uh, we're just beginning to do that in development. And I think that's the fundamental challenge. Yeah. The fundamental challenge is to take the work we do in health, education, social protection, even the work we do on road building and mm-hmm. on bridge building, the work we do on improving private sector growth in the developing world. We've got to be just as committed to collecting all the great information from the world and finding out, uh, out how to apply it in a local setting. We've got to be as committed to that as the private sector is to uh, earning money. Yeah. Why, why are the operations and execution of, of some, not definitely not all, because most businesses go out of business. Right. But the ones who stay, they are so good at execution because they have to be. Market forces are on top of them. 
Those of us in, uh, in, uh, in, in the development world have to be just as committed to excellence and exec- execution and, and, and bringing that kind of information together as they are in the private sector. Certainly, I feel that, the, um, uh, that, 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 that there's tremendous meaning in trying to get better at execution. We're trying to do that here at the World Bank Group. Yes, well, I can see the, um, a thread there be- you know, with one of your earlier answers, which was also about uh, not using a one-size-fits-all approach, uh, whether we're talking about uh, dependency versus uh, um, a poverty trap, now whether we're talking about other kinds of delivery systems. The point is to learn as much as possible from as many cases as possible. It's not about dogma. It's about execution um, and, and, and finding through a, a multiplicity of inputs um, how to create the, the best possible execution and then learn from that and make it even better over time. Exactly. Uh, at the at the Social Good Summit uh, at the 92nd Street Y in the fall, you talked about um, creating a, uh, a culture of inclusion, that inclusion was a key part of uh, the World Bank Group's work in development. And I wonder if you'd say a little bit about um, how how that how that is executed. You know, we, we think about economic development, we think about poverty relief, we think about uh, fighting diseases. Um, uh, how is inclusion part of that process? One bit of really good news, Michael, is that uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, it's going to be very hard to actively exclude the poor and the marginalized. It's just getting harder, which is great. Yes. Right? So people are including themselves. People are forcing us. Uh, to, to be more inclusive, and it's happening all over the world. You know, I, I, um, uh, I'm a student of anthropology, and I know that, uh, that, that uh, um, you're a student of history. And so if you look back in history, you know, who would have guessed that some of the most astounding social movements would come out of the Arab world, right? right. I mean, we, we learned that this stuff happens in Latin America, yeah. but this is just not going to happen in the Middle East. And look what happened, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so that's, that's part of the good news. But there are a lot of other really specific things that I didn't understand. For example, <clears throat> two and a half billion people in the world don't have access to financial services. That means they can't have a savings account. Right. And they can't rent an apartment. And there's just so many things they can't do because of, of this fundamental thing. So I'm a huge believer in setting targets. So at our last uh, annual meeting, uh, along with the Queen of the Netherlands, we set a target of having every single human being in the world have access to financial services by 2020. Now it's you know it's only seven years away. <clears throat> it's going to be a huge task. Right. But I think I think there are very specific things that we have to do to talk about inclusion. You know, gender equality is one of our big yep. um, uh, issues, and you know we're beginning to say and 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 be very specific about things like you are go- you are going to lose points. Uh, percentage points of economic growth if you don't include women. Right. I mean, our estimate estimate is that uh, uh, that Japan even has lost significant GDP growth as a result of a non-participation of women, something that they're working on. Korea, the same thing. Yeah. So the fundamental issue is inclusion probably won't be a choice that you can make right. later on because people are, are standing up. But moreover, your efforts to be inclusive are actually smart economics. Yeah. That there's just plenty of evidence that greater inclusion in which you're truly drawing from the brilliance of the entire population, not just the upper echelon who've yeah. always had access uh, to resources, that, that if you draw from the entire population and you look at fundamental things like <clears throat> what's the likelihood of going from the bottom fifth of the economic yeah. uh, range to the top fifth? You know, we're, we're looking at this stuff in the United States, yeah. Raj yeah. Chetty. I was just looking at his research from Harvard. And Raj Chetty is showing that there are enormous differences across cities in the United States yes. about ability to move from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. And this is something that we're going to definitely look more at. Because if that is not in place, then you've really got a problem with equality of opportunity. And we, again, we would argue that that builds instability into your social fabric. Yeah, well, it's so interesting because it, here again, inclusion isn't just something you layer on at the last minute as a kind of moral uh, packaging. It is it is uh, part and parcel part of economic development, part of the growth uh, uh, of cap- capacity or capabilities and, and, and improvements in health. So thank you very much for, for that answer, Jim. And, and I, I just wanted to ask you,
to a question really for our students in this class, mostly living outside the United States, uh, various uh, ages and dif different uh, walks of life, and uh, all of whom are concerned about some of these major challenges facing the, the planet. You talked at the 92nd Street Y at the Social Good Summit about uh, building a social movement to fight extreme poverty, and I wonder if you would say a, a few words to our students about the kinds of things they can do to participate in this movement, to make a positive difference. One of the, the great privileges that I've had, Michael, is I've had a chance to actually participate in social movements. Probably the most uh, notable one was the movement to uh, increase access to treatment for people living with HIV AIDS. The best part of that social movement is we started in an almost impossible situation, right? There was something we did before that, treating uh, patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis, but then that never really turned into a movement. It was more of our, our uh, the advocacy of a small group of people. But HIV treatment turned into a movement. Yes. And so, you know, I really got to see uh, what that feels like, and I got to see what it, what, what it looks like. And there's some things that, uh, that, that I, I, I want all the students in your class to know. First of all, I want to congratulate them for taking this class. And I don't know where my lecture will fit in, but I congratulate them for sticking it out. And uh, I would say this. <clears throat> First of all, uh, you know, know that, that social movements that have a huge impact are often led by a very small group of people. So ACT UP, uh, uh, which right. was the social movement that really uh, led to uh, the availability of AIDS treatment, uh, was never more than 20 or 30 people. And people think it was thousands and thousands of people, but it never was. It was 20 or 30 people who, thank God, some, some of them are still alive today, many of them, in fact. They told me that it was always about 20 or 30 people. And, you know, that old, there's that old uh, uh, Margaret Mead quote saying, you know, never doubt the ability of a small group of people to change the world. In fact, yeah. it's the only thing that ever has. I think that is so true. So, first of all, the students should never doubt the ability of themselves and a small group of like-minded people to change the world. It can happen. And so this small group of people, what they did was they said, first of all, let's look at the entire value chain. Now, that's not the word they use. That's right, something right. that uh, Michael Porter at Harvard Business School invented. But the way Mike talks about value chain is look at everything you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be, in his case, adding value. So he said most companies don't do that. They do one piece of it mm. and wonder why they're not adding value. And so what the AIDS activists did was they said, let's look at every single step. First, there needs to be more basic science research. So a bunch of them, uh, like five, right, <laughs> went and took on basic science research. And they started going after the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease. They went into the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and threw blood on people. You know, these scientists, these nerdy scientists, never had anything like that happen to them, and they didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. And then uh, over time, uh, and in fact, fairly quickly, and we have to really take our hat off to, to President Reagan for doing this, they started moving money to NIH, and so the research started. Then the next part was, okay, if there's a promising molecule, you got to get it into the industry because public sector uh, institutions are not going to take this to a drug. There's got to right. be the profit motive. And so they made it easier for molecules to go from the founder into the private sector. Then what they had to do was they had to test those drugs. So they put their own bodies on the lines to take those drugs. Right. Then they had to get it uh, into the last stage of clinical trials and get it to the market. And so what they did was one person, uh, uh, Mark Harrington, became an expert on the Food and Drug Administration. I mean, this is a guy who has an undergraduate degree from Harvard, smart guy. He became an expert on the FDA and shrunk the time it takes to get a molecule from uh, discovery to approval and on the market. Shrunk it dramatically. And so... Uh, you'd think that at that point, when they, had a, when they had a real treatment in 1996, that they would have stopped. But that's not when they stopped. They took the next step and said, damned if we're going to let something that, that has come from so much work be available only for people who can afford to pay for it. So then the next thing they did was work with us to try to make sure that everyone in the world would have access to it. Right? So for them, the social movement was not about a feel-good rally. Yeah. They did that too, but mostly it wasn't feel good. They, they latched themselves to the White House. They threw blood on people and got arrested. Right. They did things that may, would make anyone else really uncomfortable, but they knew that that's what they needed to do to get through the value chain. Yeah. So what I would say is being part of a social movement is going to be the most exhilarating, memorable thing you're ever going to do. But understand how hard it is yeah. and understand how serious you need to be about everything it's going to take to get to the change you want and then take it on because there's nothing better you can do. And, and you know, 
uh, what, what, what do we, you know, we need to start a movement to end poverty. And it looks like folks are doing it. There's a global poverty project that's begun doing it. They, they're holding these big concerts. Uh, they're serious about ending poverty. Pope Francis is serious yes, about ending yes. poverty. I had the great um, uh, opportunity to sit with him. And, you know, after years of, uh, of struggling with my Spanish in Peru, it was good enough to speak to him in Spanish. Excellent. And I asked him, I said, I need your help. I need your help. Uh, we need to start a social movement. And he just said, uh, cuenta conmigo, you know, count on me. This has to be the next movement. And if you look at all the steps that it's going to take to end poverty, it's a pretty broad mix. And that's the great news. Yep. The great news is we need everybody. We need everybody. We need writers who can write about this. We need engineers. We need doctors. We need lawyers. We need artists. We need everybody who can capture the imagination of the world to end poverty. There's a role. But take a step back and say, what is it going to take? What part of it can I take on? And how can we really make it happen? Well, I think in this class there will be artists and writers and photographers and scientists and engineers. And I know they'll be inspired by your words. And, uh, and I know they'll be learning things about the issues and uh, finding ways to connect with each other to build this kind of movement. Jim Kemp, thank you so much for being part of this conversation and part of our class. And uh, best of luck to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a great idea and a great class. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. So uh, Banerjee and Duflo have what they call the ubiquitous three eyes. The ubiquitous three eyes: ignorance, ideology, and inertia. Ignorance, ideology, and inertia. Um, ignorance. Get rid of ignorance through education. Confront ignorance through education. Make sure the people you're trying to help have um, accurate information about what it means to deal with uh, disease, uh, to deal with uh, 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 farming techniques, to deal with markets. Um, uh, the second thing that it really gets in the way uh, uh, of aid and these three eyes is, uh, is uh, ideology. Don't let ideology dictate the kind of interventions you use. I mean, some people say it has to be about markets. It has to be about markets because markets are great and governments are terrible. Other people say it has to be about uh, philanthropy. It has to be about philanthropy. We can't just depend on capitalism. Duflo and Banerjee and their team at MIT and other teams like them that are doing these uh, much more experimentally oriented aid programs, uh, they say, don't let ideology get, get dictate your aid programs let experimentation dictate your aid programs. Do experiments, rapid prototyping, test what you prototype. If it doesn't work, don't continue to do it. Um, and then refine what your aid programs on the basis of empirical testing with randomized trials, which means, and that's the hard part ethically, is that some people won't get the aid, so you can determine, you can determine if the aid is making the difference by creating randomized trials. The third problem, uh, the third of the eyes is inertia, is that we sometimes just think it's going to stay this way because it's been this way for so long. And it's very important. Remember how we started off this week on poverty with some of the statistics from the World Bank. We have cut global poverty dramatically over the last uh, decades. Uh, inertia is, can be defeated through experimentation, uh, education, um, and the application of what we know to some of the gravest problems uh, that are facing the world. What can we do? Well... You'll hear some of the calls for action from, um, so from the speakers at the Social Good Summit. Uh, but here are a couple of things that uh, I ask you to think about as we move through those uh, videos and, and, and think about the calls to action. Jim Kim talks about this in, in his, uh, uh, his brief talk at the Social Good Summit. He talks about beginning a social movement, beginning a social movement uh, that, that is agitate for the end of extreme poverty. Uh, it is unconscionable that the richest countries in the world are not doing more, not just throwing money at a problem, but doing more by using their resources to create experiments to show how aid will work in specific parts of the world. We know how to do that. We know how to do that. The AIDS crisis showed us how to do that. It was because of, of political pressure on the big pharmaceutical country, com companies and on governments around the world um, that we actually changed the way the global community dealt with AIDS and with fantastic success. Um, a social movement starts with the perception that it doesn't have to be this way. 
you don't have to have this level of extreme poverty. In 1990, 43% of people on the planet lived in extreme poverty. 43%. In 2010, that number was cut to 21%. That is, we more than halved the rate. We cut the rate of extreme poverty in half between 1990 and 2010. According to the World Bank, the number of people living on less than a dollar a day has fallen below one billion. Now, this means that we know how to reduce extreme poverty. We can cut that rate um, much, much further in the next decades. Um, the World Bank attributes the worldwide decline in poverty to um, the increase in economic growth, GDP, um, uh, the gross domestic uh, a product across the developing world has, um, has uh, been increasing, and even with the economic crisis uh, of recent years. Uh, East Asia, the world's most populous region, uh, has had an astounding uh, economic growth uh, and a concomitant reduction in extreme poverty, uh, 9% uh, since 1990. Um, now, it's important to note and, and economists uh, like uh, at the World Bank and other places have noted this, that economic growth in an area where there is extreme poverty doesn't necessarily mean that that growth is addressing the problem of poverty. You can have one social class getting a lot richer promoting economic growth, and it's not getting to the people who need it most. So what's so important, and this is where we started our comments uh, on poverty, is that the economic growth is inclusive, that in fact... Um, high unemployment is being faced through economic growth and that uh, women and young people are included in the patterns of economic growth. Otherwise, you'll have a real development of industry and finance uh, and energy, uh, but you'll still be leaving uh, too many people behind. There's a lot of work left to be done. We have cut extreme poverty. We know how to continue to cut it, uh, but there's a lot left to be done. The fight to end extreme poverty is a fight for greater equality, inclusion, and it also will result in better chances for a peaceful world. When you have extreme poverty, you have a breeding ground for discontent that can lead to violence. It has led to violence, is leading to violence, uh, because extreme poverty exists within sight of extreme wealth. And extreme poverty is an example of social injustice. People who live uh, on the margins of extreme poverty are, are much more likely to take up arms to claim uh, a, a more private goods uh, when, um, uh, if the social goods of a more balanced economic growth and inclusion uh, are not made available uh, in their regions. Peace and poverty go together. Social justice and poverty go together. I'm asking you um, in materials for this week to look at the work done uh, by the Poverty Action Lab, by um, uh, the Millennial uh, Goals Project, uh, by uh, groups uh, that are instigating action to demand coordinated efforts to eradicate extreme poverty we can cut the rate in half again, um, and um, within a generation or so, we can be at the edge of the elimination of extreme poverty on the planet. You can join the Global Poverty Project. You can look at some websites. We'll send you their URLs of getting involved yourselves, um, either through philanthropy or through political movements that show our governments that we care about poverty because we care about a more equitable, more just, um, and a more stable world. I hope you'll find the videos from the Social Good Summit and some others that I'll recommend to you useful in orienting the actions you think you should take um, to address an issue uh, that is plaguing still under a billion people, but far too many people. Those actions won't get rid of poverty before this class is over, obviously.
but they will put us in a position to contribute to the eradication of extreme poverty, just like we've been able to eradicate some of the great diseases that have plagued the planet. Global poverty can be eliminated if we work together. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.